Good morning and welcome to Pitlochry Baptist Church, to our YouTube service. Whether you're listening on Heartland FM, watching us on YouTube in the present time or at, at some time in the future, know that you are very welcome and that you're part of our church family this morning. One of the things that I really love about leading worship in the church is when we stand up and the congregation stand up and they start to sing and you're leading worship but you're looking out on God's people praising and worshipping in their own way. Some people raise their heads and sing to the, the rafters. Some people want to look down. Some people close their eyes, raise their hands. Some people don't sing because they want to just close their eyes and listen to the words and listen to the voices. And that is the thing that I really, really miss about not being able to gather together to sing. And I know that lots of churches have started meeting again. We haven't for now because of the size of our building and the number of people that we would get in. But to come to worship and not sing, that's hard, isn't it? So this morning, I'm asking you to use your imagination. I'm inviting you in to worship with us. I'm Ruth, this is Drew. Hopefully you've seen us before and you've got to know who we are. But please worship with us in whichever way you feel the most comfortable. This morning, our first song is The Lord is Gracious and Compassionate. Quite a lot of the songs we sing in church, some of the words are taken directly from verses in the Bible, and particularly a lot of the Psalms. The words in this particular song come from Psalm 145 and a verse in Psalm 103. But I thought I would just read the relevant verses in Psalm 145. It's verses 8 to 14. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendour of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your domination endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises, and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. So this morning, join us in this wonderful psalm and praise in the way that you feel most comfortable. Oh 
compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Most people's conversion experience they would describe as a mountaintop experience. Whether that happened over a long period of time or in a specific location like mines in a wee hall in the east coast of Scotland and leaving. But the reality is those mountaintop experiences are few and far between. Not that we can't commune or be in relationship or journey with God and that is in itself mountaintop. I mean those big moments, those wow moments. Because the next day, invariably we have to come down the valley. I'd like you to turn with me if you're following me in your Bible uh, to Mark chapter 9. Mark is the second book in the New Testament. It's about that much in your Bibles. And in Mark chapter 9, there is a mountaintop experience. It's one of those occasions in the Bible where God speaks directly and is heard audibly, speaking about Jesus. And uh, Jesus, on this mountaintop experience, is hanging out with Moses and Elijah. The disciples who go with Jesus, just a few of them, see Jesus in his glory. See Moses, who has been dead for centuries, but see him in his uh, resurrection uh, body as it were see Elijah and Moses in glory and Jesus in his glory and it's an incredible moment for those disciples and they kind of make a hash of it but they still see it and it's wonderful and the time is they have to come down they come down the mountain and as they come down the mountain we, we, we catch up with the story here from verse um, 14 in Mark chapter 9 when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to him. What are you arguing uh, with them about? He asked. And a man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashing his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. 
The mountain top is behind Jesus and the other disciples as it were. It was a great experience. But here's the reality they face in the ordinary lives and in the ordinary experience of the disciples. They had saw Jesus perform miracles on numerous occasions and a crowd had gathered because this man had brought his son who the Bible says had been possessed by a demon and was destroying his life. Not only was it destroying the young boy's life, but it was destroying this man's life. And no doubt the family members as well, because it was all consuming. They could not move on. And so the disciples thought, hey, we've seen Jesus do this. We're going to step in with authority and cast this demon out and bring this man to a mountaintop experience. And yet it doesn't happen that way. Because when Jesus arrives, he finds that the disciples were simply arguing with the, the crowd that was gathered. Crowd who were a mixed crowd. Some genuinely were interested to see something positive. But the others were teachers of the law. Those who were coming to try and trip up Jesus or his disciples. To try and find something that was not of God about them. And to bring down their reputation. And so... A wonderful mountaintop experience had turned into a valley experience. And this is what Jesus had found out as he came down the mountain. Do you know what? One of the, one of the bi biggest obstacles of faith in Jesus is the incompetence, is the complacency, and is the arrogance of followers of Jesus Christ. Followers like me. Because it's by the grace of God we go. And in our daily lives, our daily lives we will come up against obstacles. We fail. And sometimes we try and put on a show. Sometimes we try and pretend that we can do better than we are. Rather than just being honest. I don't know. I don't know how to get through this. You know, that's when a time, that, that is a time when followers of Jesus Christ should display some faithfulness in God. He is who he says he is. And in that journeying of faithfulness, some fruitfulness, because in the valley, we all hit walls. And so this is what happens next in the story. Jesus says, O oh, unbelieving generation. I think he says that mostly to his disciples, to his followers. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so we pick up in verse 22. They, they brought, or, or certainly the dad brought the boy to Jesus. And since the Spirit saw Jesus, or when the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy, How long has he been like this? From childhood. Can you imagine that? This boy has been possessed and thrown about all over the place, foaming. He's been a spectacle. He's fallen behind his peers. His father has taken this boy to all the quacks, to all the, the teachers of the law, to all would-be messiahs and miracle uh, people who perform miracles, and all the doctors. And yet, still at this moment, this is his experience. He is still foaming at the mouth. He's still in a a life that was not meant for him. And then this is what happens at this point. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to try and kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us. Sometimes when we're really under pressure, 
our core values come out and sometimes those core values come out in a single word. And I wonder if you caught that single word there. If you can do anything. If. It's a powerful little preposition right at the beginning of that sentence. It isn't a word, a word filled with faith because I would imagine if the, the dad uh, had heaps of faith, he would have said, since. What a difference that sentence would have made. Since you can do anything, have pity and help us. But he didn't say that. He says, if. And if to you and to I is a valley word. It's not a mountaintop experience word. It's an everyday preposition. It's a valley word. And Jesus picks up on that man in verse 23, he says to him, If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Jesus says, everything is possible if you believe. And I dearly believe that there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the person of Jesus. I put my faith not in a set of dogmas or beliefs, although they are important, because it is uh, very important to know how to live according to God's will. No, I put my faith in the person of God the Father and of Jesus the Son and in the Holy Spirit. All things are possible for those who believe if they put their faith in him and if they trust in him. But you see, the dad had an iffy faith. He had a, a, an iffy faith that produced an iffy prayer. If you can. What does Jesus do? Does Jesus take the humph? Because Jesus obviously picked up on his shallow faith and his faith that was hanging by a thread. What does Jesus do? Jesus has compassion. Heaps and heaps and heaps of compassion. Doesn't leave him in that place of iffy faith, but takes it and does wonderful things. Why? Because he has compassion. Verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me un overcome my unbelief. The dad's response is from the depth of his heart. At that moment, all of those years of longing and waiting and desiring and spending his time, his money, his, his family's hope, um, was, was thrown into that prayer. Help me, Jesus, overcome my unbelief. I believe, yet I doubt. I pray, yet I, I wonder. I hope, and yet I fear. Lots of ifs in the valley experience. I believe, Father, Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, help me overcome my unbelief. The dad's prayer is a doubter's prayer. And there are many experiences in the valley when I doubt. I believe, help me overcome my unbelief, Jesus. And here's what happens. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You death and mute spirit, he says, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again because he had the power to do just that. Even the evil spirits, the demons, the powers and principalities must obey him who is the creator and sustainer of all things. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out, didn't go out without a fight. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet. And he stood. At this point, Jesus showed compassion. Jesus gave this man and this son a future. So what's that got to do with us? Well, I, I especially wanted to bring this little thought after last week where I was speaking about 
stepping off of that mountain, trusting in Jesus, putting your faith in him and, and seeing where the adventure can go and it could be dangerous. Because most of us live in the valleys. Um, you may struggle with believing that this story is true. You may struggle in believing that there is such a thing as demons. Maybe you're not sure about miracles either. And maybe you really understand the iffy faith and the iffy prayer of that father. Just a tiny verse to encourage you and to remind you that God is compassionate even in these valley experiences with iffy prayers and iffy faith. From Jude, a tiny book, second last book in the Bible, in verse 22, and it simply says this, be merciful to those who doubt. Be merciful to those who doubt. This is God's word, comes from God's heart. And therefore, he who penned it, inspired by the Holy Spirit, reveals God's heart to you and to me with our iffy faith and our iffy prayers. Maybe, just maybe, you are at that cliff edge. A cliff edge where tomorrow fills you with despair and doubt. Uh, you're not looking forward to that Monday morning or whatever day it's going to be. And for some reason you've tuned in or you listened in because there is just something about Jesus. Forgive the church because we've made a mess of it far too often. But I hope you're inspired by disciples of Jesus Christ. Just as I was at the age of 15. And I would um, just implore you to read that story again and see how Jesus comes to us in our everyday situations. And his desire is to bring life because that father took that son away into a future. The boy could start his education. The boy could maybe then go on and have a trade. Maybe he would be married and maybe he would be blessed with children and grandchildren that he would sit in his, his knee in an inheritance. That's what God desires to give us, even if we have iffy faith and iffy prayers. Jesus desires to come and take away the emptiness and the hopelessness and bring joy in a future. May it be so for you and me. And I pray that in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I invite you to just calm your heart uh, close your eyes if you would, and let's just pray. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Take us as we are, we can come no other way. Take us deeper into you, and may all of those things that are not of you melt away. Make us like a precious stone that's crystal clear and finely honed. The love of Jesus would shine through in our lives and we would give glory to you. Father, that prayer may seem so far off for many of us. Meet us where we are. Find us in your love and in your passion. Bring us home to you. May we have a life and a future in Jesus even when our world is in so much turmoil, so much uncertainty, I pray, Lord God, that we would know you, know life in its fullness, and live a life that is worthy of you, life in all of its fullness as Jesus promised. Your blessing on our nations, your blessing on our key workers, we pray, your blessing on those who lead, that they would be honest, hardworking and safe. And Father God, may your church be a light in our communities, a people on its knees, conscious of its own shortcomings, its own sinfulness, repentant 
and in prayer that your kingdom come and your will would be done. For your glory, I pray. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, in whom I have my being, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. thank you for who you are. We thank you that you have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. And yours is the name above all names. My prayer this morning is that whoever you are, wherever you are, that God will have spoken to you, either through the word brought by the pastor, through the singing of these songs, 
We don't sing perfectly. We don't play perfectly. But we worship from our hearts. And I just pray that God will have touched you this morning, wherever you are, and that you will know the power of his love and his presence. That whatever is going on in your life, you will find a way to bring it to the cross, to bring it to Jesus. Because he is powerful. He has no rival. He has no equal. He is the name above all names. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please, if you need to speak to anybody in our fellowship, to the pastors, to any of us, just drop us a line. You'll find our details on our website. Have a good week. Bye. God bless.